Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Pete Damiano. I direct the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and what a great representation of town and gown and students and faculty and community members to come here tonight to join, in, uh, join us in welcoming Sarah Chase to the University of Iowa. Um, it's really uh, also within the university, it's been a great example of interdisciplinary collaboration in terms of who's been co-sponsoring this event and the people that are interested. And it's you know, a really important topic, obviously, of corruption and, and the implications of corruption on different types of international relations. Um, want to give a little shout out to Representative Chuck Eisenhardt from Dubuque, no local political connection here, but he was a person that had invited Sarah originally to Iowa and reached out to us and asked if we might be interested in having her come here. And we said, absolutely. Her, her background is perfect for a talk about public policy and things that we thought people would be interested in. Um, and many in different units, as I mentioned, were really interested about having her. One of those that's also been one of our main collaborators is international programs. So I'd like to introduce Russ Gannam, who's the associate provost and dean of the international programs here, just to do a, a brief welcome. So Russ, will you please come up? Many thanks, Pete. International Programs has always partnered closely with the Public Policy Center, and we are delighted to co-sponsor tonight's event with the renowned journalist and political advisor, Sarah Chase. Ms. Chase's work on how corruption infiltrates public life aligns directly with a symposium International Programs held earlier this year entitled Corruption, the Rise of Populism, and the Future of Democracy. Tonight's talk is a continuation of our project to educate the Iowa community on threats to democracy and the rule of law. International Programs is thus proud to extend the warmest of welcomes to Sarah Chase. Thank you, Russ. I'd also like to give a shout out to our other co-sponsors of this event, including the School of Journalism and Mass Communications. We have Melissa Tully here, who's the director of the school, Departments of Political Science, Sociology, and Criminology, the School of Planning and Public Affairs, the College of Law, the University Lecture Committee, the Division of Student Life, and as I mentioned about the town gown part, the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, which is a group that we are a member and very, very proud member, and Catherine is here somewhere, uh, the executive director. Um, and it's, again, one of those great relationships, and we as a public university feel very strongly that that relationship between the university and the town needs to be there. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to the staff of the Public Policy Center, including Juliana Lee, Nami Srendroth, and Connie Sherman, and Natalie also, for all the background work that they did to make sure that this could happen. Um, and thanks to all of you that are both here in person and those that are joining us online um, as we're live streaming the event. Um, now I'd like to introduce Sarah Mitchell, a professor of political science, who's also a senior research fellow at the Public Policy Center, who will serve as the moderator for tonight's event and introduce Sarah Chase. Well, Sarah. Sarah without an H. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome, Sarah. Our plan for the evening is to have Sarah speak for 30 to 45 minutes and then respond to questions from the audience for 30 to 45 minutes. For the audience here in the Senate chambers, you'll see that there are note cards and pens at the end of the rows. Um, so if you have questions, uh, feel free to write them down and then uh, pass them to the end and then we'll, we'll have people collecting them as we move into the Q&A. Uh, the online audience can also submit questions uh, to the Public Policy Center at ppc at uiowa.edu. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Sarah Chase. Ms. Chase has had a diverse and interesting career, from reporting for, for National Public Radio to serving as a special assistant to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. She is internationally recognized for her innovative thinking on corruption and its implications. She served as an expert at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and she was just telling us about great opportunities for students to have a, a fellowship Fellowship? Yeah, <laughs> fellowship, junior fellowship at the... International relations interested students. This is year-long fellowship after you graduate from your undergraduate degree, and it's a great opportunity. 
yeah, so you can go work with Sarah and, <laughs> and others. Oh, oh, not anymore, but okay. Uh, uh, and then uh, she's also obviously written books uh, on the topic of corru corruption, including On Corruption in America and What is at Stake. She'll be signing books uh, following the event just outside this room, and we want to thank Prairie Lights for facilitating the book signing. Uh, tonight, she will examine the dynamics of systematic corruption and its role in fueling almost every crisis facing the world, including destruction of the environment. So please help me welcome Ms. Sarah Chase. Can I get you to grab that? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm really thrilled. I'm actually looking at these names, and I could not be happier than to see all of these different, you know, organizations, institutions, um, communities getting together tonight, and I'm very, very proud of that, and very grateful uh, to the university for the welcome and the cat herding and the, I mean, I almost walked up here with a beer in one hand and a chocolate chip cookie in the other hand, you know, but I managed to get them down before I got up here. So, um, yeah, and, and you heard the title of that last book, having spent most of my career Oh, I'm on, right. It does matter that it is green. There we go. So that, it, it, so that folks who are online um, can hear. Uh, having spent most of my life overseas and career in international relations, it was sobering, and that will come out tonight, to basically apply the same analytical framework that I had developed over the years looking at countries like Afghanistan and Nigeria and Tunisia and Uzbekistan and Honduras and Nepal and take that framework and as dispassionately as I could apply it to the United States of America. And let me tell you, um, I expected to find what I found, but that did not prepare me for the shock of finding it, for the degree of parallelism. And so I think in a lot of ways, when I talk about things now, things that are happening overseas, including, for example, Afghanistan, the disaster that you know, concluded the US engagement in Afghanistan is not just about US foreign policy. It is a mirror of us. And how that ended is an object lesson to me about how things could end up here if we don't address some of the problems at home that we, in a way, I want to say, um, it's not quite fomented, but because it's not as uh, instrumental as that, but that we certainly helped to cultivate and failed to check uh, in Afghanistan. But let me step back for a moment, and we are going to talk most of the evening about corruption, but in order to do that, I want to start a little back from there. <sighs> Whoops. <sighs> And talk about that stuff. Money. Uh, yesterday I was at Loris, and so I, and I had a priest in the audience, so it was easy to ask him, was it Timothy? Um, and it is Timothy, you know. And we usually get the quote wrong. It's not that stuff is the root of all evil. It's actually the love of money. Money is inert. It's what we do with it. It's what role we invite it to play in our society. And it might be interesting, particularly for some of you whose top knots look more like mine than like yours, um, to ask ourselves whether money has taken on a different significance, social significance, over the course of our lifetimes. And I've had a very interesting time. I spent two weeks in Nigeria asking people only that question, and boy, did I get strong answers. And among them, for example, was it used to matter 
where your money came from. And I would get story after story of a person who would say, oh, I found 50 bucks on the street, you know. Um, and then they would get beaten by their parents because they couldn't explain where their money had come from. Or sometimes their parents would bring them before the elders in the, in the village. And one person said, I was so terrified, I found some. And I was so terrified, I gave it to the first person walking past. And by contrast, they say now it just, the only thing that matters is the amount how much of it you have. And I was doing some interviewing in West Virginia, which is where I live, right along the Ohio River, um, and got also this incredibly pithy statement. Money washes hands. Money washes hands. And I found that really fascinating. And so what I'm getting at is that money has come to be almost the sole measure of social standing in our society. And that is, I mean, the other thing about this stuff is it's a revolutionary way of measuring and accumulating wealth, right? If your wealth is counted in olive trees, you gotta work. Like, first of all, you can only have so many, you know, or uh, acres and corn. Right? We're in Iowa. Uh, you have to take care of those plants, even more olive trees in a way than corn, because they need, you need to be able to bequeath those trees to your children. And so there is a lavishing of effort, love, dare I say, on the source of your well being. And the amount that you can accumulate is not infinite. That stuff, especially when it's counted in electronic signals, which it is these days, there is no upper limit on how many zeros you can have in your bank account, right? And if money is the measure of social standing, there's, it's not about having enough in order to buy something I want or to put money away for my child's education. It's about having one more zero than the next guy, right? And that is a race with no finish line. And w so when money starts taking on that role in a society, you'll see that corruption is rarely far behind because the rules don't matter anymore. When it doesn't matter how, where your money came from, then, you know, all bets are off. Um, so that is, um, boy, there isn't a flashlight. Like, my eyes aren't so good as, you know, as they used to be. Let's see if I can even see this. Um, um, so now let me talk a little bit about the type of corruption that I'm on about. In this country, we have a tendency to think of corruption as a single scandal, as a transaction between two parties. You know, quid pro, pro, quid pro quo, which was talking about Ukraine, got to be an expression that was very much in the public consciousness around the period of the first Trump uh, impeachment. Quid, it became very important to establish that there had been a quid pro quo between President Trump and uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. Um, I am trying to argue that that's an extremely narrow way of understanding what corruption is. And part of that narrowness is deliberate because the laws, at least in the United States, the laws have been deliberately narrowed from about 1987 until, I mean, the nail in the coffin was 2016. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, there's a reason for that. Who can be guilty of criminal corruption? Who, who, what is the pool of potential suspects? Public officials, right? Who is making and interpreting the laws to do with corruption? Public officials. 
So guess what? They want to make those laws so narrow that basically you have to be worthy of being put in jail for stupidity uh, to, to actually commit a crime that is prosecutable as corruption. So what I'm talking about instead is better thought of as the operating system of sophisticated networks. So in the IR foreign relations field, we often talk about you know, fragile and failing states. You know that expression. <laughs> Is it still as popular as it was about 10 years ago? this as a sort of field of endeavor. So what I discovered is in a lot of these countries, the government, sure, they're running a state, I mean, their government may be failing, but they are not trying to govern. Their intention, their objective is not to, to run a state. Their objective is to get rich. So the state may be failing, but the network is unbelievably successful. And all you have to do is look at Afghanistan, which failed as a state, but all of the leading government officials in Afghanistan, you know, are millionaires. Um, and again, let's look at us. So I uh, have spent time living in, the, in Washington, D.C., in the Washington, D.C. area. All you have to do is like, look around Washington, D.C. at the size and luxuriousness of the houses that ring Washington, D.C., right? So let's just think about things that have happened in the last decade or so. We've had an economic meltdown that almost looks like the Great Depression. We've had two lost wars. We have an opioid crisis. We've had a global pandemic that was not handled very well. And who lives in those extremely luxurious mansions? Defense contractors. I guess the financial industry is more in New York than in, than in Washington, but you've got the same houses in New York, right? Um, you know, you can just go, so what I'm tempted, what I'm asking us to think about is here are private industries that have enormous influence over US law and policy, both at home and abroad, and the policies have failed. Financial policy failed in 2008. The whole regulatory system was a failure. Two lost wars, you know, let's go, let's go down them. An opioid crisis, again, that has to do with a failure to adequately regulate and oversee the pharmaceutical industry, um, not to mention prescription drug, drug prices and all the other health issues that we have. And yet, the networks are very successful at what they're trying to do, which is get rich. So, so let me... Um, get into a little bit about what I mean um, about network. And another thing we have a tendency to do in this country and in a lot of the West is to make a big distinction between government and business, private sector and public sector, right? And Americans can, um, we can get, talk all night about who's worse for your health, right? Government or business. The genius of these networks is they interweave across the sectors. Member, you know, business executives and government officials, often out and out criminals. And in my case in Afghanistan, I mean, so the Karzais who ran the government and also a lot of the, or a couple of the companies that were getting development projects were also running the opium business in southern Afghanistan, or at least half of it. Um, and I would argue, if I had been knocked off in downtown Kandahar by somebody wearing a black turban, would anyone have doubted that it was a Talib? What if it was Ahmed Wali Karzai, who was sick of me saying nasty stuff about him, you know, who called in one of his friends and said, Fair game over there. No one would have, that would have been invisible to us. Another example of this is Central America. I've spent time in Honduras. Um, how often have we heard that a lot of the migration 
out of Central America is because of gang violence, right? So we have this image of sort of chaotic, the gangs are in charge and this chaotic violence. Well, it took me about 36 hours in Honduras to realize that the gangs, the police were outsourcing their extortion to the gangs because that way it was plausibly deniable for the police. So you could just as easily say that government corruption has been driving a lot of the migration out of Central America into, into the United States. Um, and so that makes for an incredibly um, capable network. If you can draw upon the powers of government the flexibility and monetary and you know, financial capacities of the private sector, the border crossing and violence doing capabilities of the criminal sector, you've got a lot going for your team. And that's what these corrupt networks look like. So we again will talk about, you know the expression revolving door? That also I find to be a bit of a misleading expression because it suggests, you know how a revolving door works, there's only room for one or two people in each compartment, right? You get in there all by yourself and you push the door and you go from the inside to the outside or whatever. But in, so, so the implication is these are individuals who are crossing from the public sector to the private sector or vice versa. Whereas it's actually the network that as an operating principle wants to keep its personnel moving back and forth across uh, these lines, partly because it's in the private sector that you get to reap the rewards of what you did for the network when you were in the public sector. Uh, and in the private sector, you start learning what is the latest thing that we need the public sector to do for us. So that also brings me to a different role for what corruption, members of these networks who hold public office, what is the evil deed that they do? And I think, again, we tend to be overly focused on putting your fingers in the cookie jar like I was just doing, you know, I guess it was a cookie plate, right? But, but where a government official will be siphoning off public money for him or herself, um, or stealing the furniture or whatever, right? They, some of them do that, but that's not really the important aspect of, 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 of the role they play. One more important aspect is to channel public monies towards um, the network, right? So to um, channel public procurement towards uh, their cronies. And you see a lot of that in defense. So in On Corruption in America, I took a look at the first contract for the Iraq war. And I was blown away when I looked at this thing because it, it was like a blank check. All of the money columns said TBD, 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 TBD. And this was a 10 year contract. So it was basically, uh, you know, it was just uh, an open check on the U.S. Treasury. Um, another one that I've been talking about, and I may want to come back to this, but we've been hearing about, or, you know, I, some of you may have heard about a big Department of Justice case against um, uh, a, a scam scheme for the CARES Act. There was some group of about 20, you, I see someone nodding there, yeah, about 20 or 25 people who got together and made these invented feeding centers for kids in Minnesota, I think it was. Do you, does anyone remember? And, um, and, and it's really terrible and they scammed about $400 million uh, and they were, you know, buying properties in Kenya and of course these people conveniently are not you know, these people conveniently, let's just say, are East Africans. So let's say that they are not members of the 
Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve. Now let's take a look at the Federal Reserve. So these guys scammed, and I'm not saying they didn't commit a crime, but they scammed $400 million. Meanwhile, six trillion, six trillion of our dollars in the CARES Act were allocated by Treasury to the Federal Reserve to do what? To buy bonds. Now we hide that under the words quantitative easing, whatever the hell that means. Um, Bonds are corporate debt. Why was there a debt crisis on Wall Street? Because corporations were buying their own stock so as to artificially inflate the value of their stock so their shareholders could be richer, not to invest in their activities or to pay their employees a living wage or anything like that. They were deeply in debt in order to add zeros to their bank accounts. That is what the Federal Reserve was spending $6 trillion of our money on. But it gets worse, or better. The New York Fed decides that it does not have the in-house capacity, the corrupt network's capabilities. The New York Fed doesn't know how to buy bonds. They have to contract with somebody in the private sector, of course, to buy the bonds for them. But the New York Fed does not sign that contract. The New York Fed creates a private company, a limited liability company, an LLC. And where do they domicile that company? Take a guess, somebody. Delaware. Thank you. Delaware. Yep. Delaware, which is a secrecy jurisdiction. So now, and that company, signs a no-bid contract with BlackRock, which is the biggest money manager on Wall Street. Uh, that contract, because it's between two private companies, is inaccessible to the American citizens. So we don't know what's in the contract. We don't know the degree to which BlackRock fulfilled its obligations. We don't know what BlackRock spent our money on. We don't know what of the information, if BlackRock knows whose bonds they're buying on behalf of the United States of America, they're also trading in the very same companies, right? So they've got insider information. That is not Corruption, it's not a scam. DOJ is not going after that. I, I, I'm just sort of saying, you know, so we've got criminal justice here. Uh, where's criminal justice? Sociology and criminology. Like, that's a whole dimension of criminology that doesn't tend to get as much, I think, attention as I wish it did. Now, just to finish that story, because we're talking about networks, there's an outfit called the Revolving Door Project. Take a look at BlackRock in the revolving door contract, uh, project. They track personnel. The superhighway between BlackRock, Treasury, and the Fed, it's astonishing. Again, it's not one individual pushing a door, it's a superhighway connecting these three institutions. Um, that's what I mean when I'm talking about the operating system of of sophisticated networks, and when I'm saying, so that's an example of public monies being funded to the private sector kind of members of, of, uh, of these networks. And of course, in a country like Afghanistan or Nigeria, it's even more egregious. I mean, it's even more in your face. I don't think the amounts are hold a candle to some of the amounts in the United States, but it is a little bit more, it is a little bit easier to trace. For example, uh, well, that's a, that's a slightly different case. But the real thing that members of these networks who hold public office do, the really important thing they do, is bend and distort and repurpose the agencies and institutions of government so that they serve the network at, to the detriment of you and me, to the detriment of uh, the public interest. And that is a very long-lasting impact. And you can see it in things like the deregulatory craze that started in the 80s and got kind of rubber stamped in the 90s across political parties, right? Started by Reagan, but reinforced by Clinton in particular. Um, 
you have things like this move to, so the last case in the Supreme Court series that narrowed the, de the legal definition of corruption um, was in 2016, it was called McDonnell versus the United States, so it was the former governor of Virginia. That was a unanimous decision unanimous Supreme Court decision. We have, you know, we're always talking about the political split on the Supreme Court. On these issues, it's unanimous. It's split on social issues, but on issues of, of corruption and public integrity, it's down the line. Um, and so when I've looked at this overseas, what I've tended to do is try to look at what institutions are captured by these networks. Almost always you have the justice sector because part of the deal here, the, I've been talking about the horizontal integration of these networks, but they are vertically integrated as well. And it was really, that was the first thing that I picked up on because I realized that in Afghanistan, you couldn't drive down the street, and the same is true of Nigeria, the, I, all of these countries I've looked at, Uzbekistan. I mean, it's not only being shaken down by police in the streets, it's doctors in the hospital. You have to pay off the doctor in order to you know, get your patient seen. Um, teachers, universities are rife with it. I spoke to a journalist in Uzbekistan and he was grappling that day with whether he really had to sell his car so that he could, his daughter, I think, had passed the entrance exam, but he couldn't get her into university without paying this fat bribe. Um, and what I then learned is that money goes up the line. The police officer on the street keeps some of it but a huge amount goes up the line, so there's a vertical integration. What has to then come back down from the top is protection. So it works a lot like the mafia, in fact, where the money goes upwards and the protection goes downwards. And that was so strong, that kind of phenomenon. In Afghanistan, I was getting involved in you know, anti-corruption efforts once they started getting off the ground in around 2010. And we did a, um, a kind of test, an anti-corruption test case. And it was an open and shut case. It was a guy in Karzai's, in the palace. And he was caught on judicial wiretaps. So, you know, a warrant and that kind of a process, judicial wiretaps, extorting $350,000 or something like that bribe to interfere in, in another case that was ongoing. And Karzai made a call before nightfall, he was out of jail. And not only that, Karzai boasted about it. And that was very perplexing to all of the Western interveners. They couldn't figure out why he would like be coming clean that he had interfered, interfered with a judicial process. And he was messaging to his network. He was saying, don't you worry, I've got your back. And I could see him, he was sometimes a little more sophisticated where when he was under a lot of pressure on this at some point, he busily organized an anti-corruption conference because he knew that that would occupy all the nice State Department people. You know, they were, oh my God, there is an event that we have to now prepare for, for. So everyone's bandwidth got absorbed preparing for the event. And then he, sorry, that was a little unkind, but I'm pointing at, you know, a former state guy over there. But, the, the, I mean, Karzai was great at figuring out how we operate. I mean, when you're in a, sort of the little guy position with respect to a large, powerful international interlocutor, you depend on your wits. And he, his psychological analysis was so brilliant. So, so then he holds this conference and he says, 
you know, we this terrible problem in Afghanistan, we really have to address it, but we don't really need to put a bunch of people in jail. What we really need is better laws. And, and so, and while he's saying this, he's got two murderous warlords from the anti-Soviet period on either side of him, who are single-handedly responsible for tens of thousands of deaths during that period, and not to mention, you know, corruption and all of that kind of thing. So, I'm, and, and, and we were all lapping it up because the words were what we wanted to hear, and oh boy, there are plenty of Western experts who know how to draft other people's laws, you know. So that was going to be plenty of work for the anti-corruption experts who could draft great laws, and and then he was sending the message to the network, don't you worry, no one's going to jail. And he was sending the message to the people, don't you try to revolt because here's what I have going for me. You know, like, don't get too uppity because I've got people who don't mind killing people on my team. And so here was this guy who managed to send three very effective messages to three separate audiences in one fell swoop. Another example, just while I'm on Karzai and his brilliance, and just to be mean to us and our diplomacy again. The other, the other guy th whose number he really had was John Kerry, who at the time was the um, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. So Karzai would like throw a temper tantrum, and nobody wanted Karzai all over the newspapers. So Kerry had been sort of the designated Karzai, hand, Karzai whisperer. So Kerry would bustle off to, to Kabul and spend two or three days walking Karzai around the Rose Garden in his palace. And I don't know if any of you have looked at the schedule card of a US senator. Three days, I mean, three days is an unthinkable thinkable amount of time for a U.S. senator. And then he would say, oh, well, I'm all the way over here. So then he'd go to Pakistan. I'll go to Pakistan and do something useful. You know? So he'd spend a day in Pakistan. And then Karzai would have another meltdown. And Kerry would have to like, hold his hand again for another three days in Kabul on his way back to Washington. So this was like, whatever we do, we can't get Karzai upset because it's going to take six days out of the calendar of one of our top U.S. officials. And it worked like a charm. It worked like a charm. Um, okay, let's see. What else do I want to... Um... get at here? Um, okay, the second part of this spawns international crises. I didn't go to Afghanistan planning on talking, uh, planning on working on corruption. I was just going to try to rebuild the country. It was Afghans who brought it to me immediately. I mean, within months, this was already an issue. And it was already an issue because of how our allying with certain forces was already allowing them to extort money from the population. So I would have people saying, this is in 2002, our number one concern, I was trying to set up a radio station, so I had a bunch of basically young people and asking them, what do you want to hear on the radio? And all they wanted to talk about was security, but it wasn't Taliban security. There weren't any Taliban at that point. They were all scattered. They were upset about the militias that the governor had gathered around him who were shaking people down on the roads. So those militias were wearing US Army fatigues. So how could ordinary Afghans not understand that we were supporting this type of behavior? And because it wasn't on our rail, r radar at all, I mean, it took me another six years, me and not just me, but to start getting that even understood that it was an issue. That guess what? People are not going to um, take risks on behalf of a government that is as hostile to their interests as the Taliban are. That's how they were experiencing it. And so that was the first round. And then the second round was after this went on for five, six, seven years, people said, look, the Americans must want the corruption. They must be in favor of it because they keep refusing to do anything about it. The Taliban must be right. And so that ended up being a draw 
a recruitment draw. So a war that we understood primarily in cultural, religious, clash of civilization terms was actually, ironically, they were upset with us for lying to them about what democracy was. They thought democracy was them getting a say in their government, was about government and rule of law, was about integrity in government. And here we were ushering this unbelievably corrupt regime into power and supporting it in power. And they're like, well, the Taliban must be right. I mean, was part of it, or at least it was Anger. I mean, if the cops just said, you know, listen, I've got a six year old daughter at home and she, her feet are gr growing and I don't have sandals to put on her feet, could you please help me out so I could buy some shoes for my daughter? I mean, someone would give that person the shoes off his own daughter's feet, but that's not how it was. It was humiliating, it was condescending, it was abusive. And so that's another thing we get wrong is too often we, even though I've been talking about that stuff, the damage that corruption does isn't only monetary, it's psychological. It's a robbing of dignity and it's humiliating and it makes people pissed. So if you got smacked in the face you know, by a police officer enough times when you wouldn't pay the bribe, what do you want to do? You want to shoot the guy if you're a young Afghan man. Well, there's an insurgency sitting out in the villages that wants him to join them and shoot the cops. It becomes pretty, pretty interesting. And so, so that's another answer, I think, to the dilemma of, why do people who are indignant about corruption um, vote in one way or another for people who are, seem to be no better if not worse? And the answer is you're not choosing toothpaste in a supermarket. You're looking for a wrecking ball because you're so furious. Um, so that's where I got into international crisis and, and corruption because I gave a talk sort of like this. It was actually an opium talk to a group of a couple hundred DEA equivalent and uh, some military officers from 40 different countries. And I couldn't, so it was mostly an opium economy talk, right? Like how the opium economy works. But at the end, I couldn't resist saying, look, the problem in Afghanistan isn't opium. Opium is just one revenue stream that's captured by the corrupt networks. It's the criminal revenue stream. But there's all these other revenue streams, including extorted bribes, which were five, two to five billion dollars a year, including development inputs, including, you know, you name it, right? So, so, so for me, opium wasn't the middle of the picture, of the frame. It was one of the revenue streams. And the reaction I got, so I was like, these are just my last two wonky slides that I just can't resist putting in there. Those were the slides that got me the best, the, mo the strongest reaction. And everyone came up saying, you just described my country. And so then I'm looking at which countries were, I'm seeing some smiles there. <laughs> uh, Syria. Sorry? Syria. Syria. Exactly. I mean, Syria is definitely one. So we'll go and maybe you can put in there. But uh, Niger we didn't have Syrians in that particular meeting, but Nigeria was one of them. Um, and, and as I'm looking at the countries, there were several Latin American countries, several Central, A Central Asian countries. And as I'm looking at that, I'm saying, wow, Boko Haram in Nigeria, you know, the Uzbek, what was the Uzbek uh, extremist group? I can't remember anymore. Um, but l several of these countries had violent, religious, or ideological extremist movements. So what I had taken to be an Afghan anomaly was um, clearly not an Afghan anomaly. So that is the work that went into Thieves of State, which I think is going to be um, available out there afterwards, which 
look, you know, I went to Nigeria, the whole Arab Spring. So everything, like, we, and again, we, we kept hearing in the States. Were you in the States in 2011 or there? I don't go to the States in 2012. 2012. So in 2011, when it was all going down, we were hearing that it was about the youth bulge. It was all these very kind of standardized or impersonal forces. It was because there weren't enough jobs for the number of young people coming up and stuff like that. And I got on the ground, so I'm still working for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at that point. And I said, boss, you know, send me downrange like you always do in Afghanistan. Let me go downrange. So I, I didn't go to Syria, but I went across North Africa. And, you know, and it took you exactly 30 seconds to realize these are uh, anti-corruption uprisings. That's what, you know, I'm looking, at, I had been in Morocco as a Peace Corps volunteer. We couldn't even use the word king when I was there. You couldn't even name that, like use that word. Uh, in Morocco, which didn't really explode in the Arab Spring, but there were still demonstrations and things, they had pictures of cabinet ministers in jail. Like, in, I was blown away. I was like, my God, this is really explicit. That whole thing was about corruption. So there's another kind. So I saw Boko Haram in Nigeria. So there's another ideological, you know, extremist militant group. That was about corruption. The whole Arab Spring, which started out as civil uprisings, but in at least two cases turned into, you know, the worst violent conflict, civil wars that were happening in the world. It was a spin-off. Um, and then, you know, not least Ukraine. So Ukraine was a little behind the Arab Spring, their anti-corruption, although I think they had, the first one was in 2010, so around the same period. But the really big anti-corruption uprising was 2014. And, you know, we're still, then you have the backlash by the corrupt patron of the corrupt government in Ukraine, which is Russia, so you get not a civil war that spins out of control, but a conventional war, you know, by the backer of the corrupt regime. Um, so there you have a conventional potential world war that is the offshoot of corruption. So that's international conflict, and we can go back to Ukraine because there's another kind of coda to that. Um, but let's, I already mentioned migration. So same thing that's happening in Central Ameri out of Central America, same thing in Africa. If you look at the countries that African migrants are leaving from, they are mostly the systemically corrupt countries uh, in Africa. Um, Syria, you've got a wave of Syrian refugees from the war that, you know, spun out of this anti-corruption uprising. Um, so basically, and they're always exacerbating other factors. It's not only corruption. So I tried to do some work where I would intersect corruption with other you know, sort of risk factors, and you can imagine what they might be. Is there a deep identity divide in the country? Like an ethnic divide, or a sectarian divide, or an urban-rural divide, or something like that, that tends to exacerbate it. Is there, are there significant environmental pressures? So add climate change and other degradation of natural habitats into this mix, and it just adds an exacerbating um, effect to this kind of thing. So that's conflict. It, that's conflict and that's migration. Environment. As electronic signally as our money is these days, wealth goes back to the land. When I started looking at the revenue streams in different countries, there were always different variations. You know, Tunisia doesn't have any oil. 
So it, oil is not a major revenue stream in Tunisia. Dates are. That was a big surprise. Um, and how the corrupt network managed to capture dates at below market rates in order to sell them at above market rates in the Gulf, like that was one that I hadn't really thought about. Um, three always show up. Energy, uh, finance, and high-end real estate. All right, you can argue that finance doesn't have to do with the land, except what are they investing in? Very often real estate, right? And real estate is about land use. Um, and so this is where you start getting, um, you know, you start getting Houston uh, that is incredibly flood prone because even the, first of all, it's deregulated, and second of all, even the regulations that exist, people are violating them. That's part of members of the network who are in government bending the rules to suit the network, right? You deregulate the environmental, you, you um, cripple environmental protection agencies. You um, offer people waivers of environmental regulations. Um, uh, so environmental crisis, including, you know, the excessive use of fossil fuels and plastics and things like that, have to do with the ways that these networks um, are able to bend our legal structures, uh, not to mention then the out and out corruption with which, you know, um, uh, parcels or leases are obtained in places like Nigeria or Angola or, uh, or whatever, but take a look at the Bureau of Land Management in the United States. So I'm being told five minutes, uh, let's see what, um, so just a couple more words on, one more word on Ukraine. Um, a phenomenon in this space that's starting finally to attract some attention is, is being called strategic corruption. And what's meant by that is the active weaponizing of corruption as an instrument of state. And I think it's pretty clear that Putin's Russia has been doing this. Putin has been doing this, making deliberate use of corruption to gain advantage, certainly over weaker neighbors like Ukraine, where it, he basically made it a client state. Um, but also, you know, penetrating the United States. I mean, it's kind of interesting to see who's making what sorts of purchases, maybe less now, but prior to the war in Ukraine, that, that was going on. Um, I think there's an argument that could be made that the post-colonial period in the developing world featured a lot of strategic corruption um, perpetrated by Western powers on those countries, right? What was done was the deliberate corruption of the newly independent elites in those countries, which that kind of establishing of that system uh, is part of what has made it so durable in countries like that uh, until today. Okay, just a few words on what do we do about this. It's very, very, very daunting. I could also get into what happens if we don't, and that's even more terrifying. So we basically don't have a choice but to try to do something. On Corruption in America is chock full of, at the end, it's almost a grab bag of stuff that ordinary people can do. Um, because I don't, I feel like strategies have to be very time sensitive. So that's one, I wanna say, um, principle I'd like to leave you with is the idea of a window of opportunity. Windows of opportunity, and there was one in Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban regime. There was one across the Arab world in the immediate aftermath of 2011. They are very short. Uh, and you really have to take advantage of them. And the networks, as Syria is a horrifying example of how resilient these networks are. And even in cases where, unlike Syria, where um, the kind of personifier of the corruption of the regime, be it Mubarak or be it, you know, uh, who was it in Guatemala? 
who got overturned in 2015, I can't remember. But we have a tendency to, to personify corruption and assume that if we just lop that person's head off, then automatically kind of democracy is going to break forth. That is not how it works, because these, these networks are networks. And they will reconfigure around. They will sometimes toss one of their own to the crowd. I feel like Egypt, you know, in a way, Mubarak was tossed to the crowd. And then the network reconfigures around that space. Um, and so window of opportunity is a really important thing to bear in mind. When one opens, move. That's when you don't sleep. That's when you put the afterburners on and don't sleep. Um, second point I want to say is, so, so, so that's part of why you won't see a strategy in on corruption. You'll see instead stuff that any of us can do. Um, and so the second point is, um, the importance of mapping these networks, um, and this is more maybe in the policy domain, but I think it also applies to us as citizens. Let's find out who's who in the zoo here. Like, who is, um, you know, who's the cousin who's the property owner when his cousin is the district commissioner, you know, loosening the regulations on waterfront property, things like that. I mean, I think, and, and I think it might be interesting in an agricultural state to look at who designed the subsidies for what type of agriculture or who designed the rules for crop insurance. Why is it that you're only, you're only able to take out insurance on a single crop on a certain parcel of land, whereas it might be much better for the land to intercrop or to, you know, I mean, there might be other agricultural techniques that are being shut out systemically by the way the system is functioning. So then what are the relationships between the private sector and the public sector side of, the, of that kind of decision making? Um, the, yeah, this may be the most important one. So kleptocratic networks don't take um, challenge laying down. They have counter moves. And the most important counter move is playing on our identity divides. Because if there is something that humans are more reactive about even than the principle of justice, like that's no fair, it's this is us and that's them. And we get really great eyesight when we're looking at corruption in the other camp. But suddenly our cataracts kick in when, you know, when we're looking at our own side. And so what I'd really like to two things I'd like to leave us with. One is hold your own community, whatever you think of as your community, be it your family, be it your race, be it your political affiliation, hold your community up to its highest standards. And that's a little bit biblical too. It's like the, you know, the, uh, the what in your neighbor's eye? The moat, thank you, the moat in your neighbor's eye. But that's not a way of saying don't ever criticize your neighbor. It's look at your community and it's not an act of disloyalty to hold your community up to its own standards, on the contrary. To me, that's an act of patriotism. And finally, um, we're gonna have, there is room for every single one of us in this fight whatever our talents and inclinations like all of us. And guess what, we're all being, we get told it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be inconvenient. You know, if you don't wanna buy from Amazon, oh gosh, you have to wait three whole days until you can get your book from the local bookstore instead of getting it overnight. Isn't that terrible, you know? Or you have to drive further to go to, you know, what, what's the great grocery store in town? You don't have to drive further because it's in town. What is it, the, the independent little grocery store? Dirty Joe's or something like that? 
Dirty John's, Dirty John's, right? Like, like imagine you're out in the country and Dirty John's is like, you know, three towns away. All right, so you have to drive a little further to go there than to go to the dollar store, to go to Walmart's, but, or whatever it is, whatever the supermarket is, bring some friends along. Make a road trip of it. Let's make the fight a celebration or we'll never get through it. Thank you very much. I did this at a school called Frostburg, which is in Western Maryland, and the first question in the audience was, it was a hundred bucks then, do, do you need that hundred dollars? <laughs> Thank you for, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks for a great talk. Um, so I have some questions that have been submitted and I'll be, uh, Going through them. Sorting, okay. sorting them out. The first question had to do with um, how did international corruption play a role in the recent takeover of the Taliban in Afghanistan? Yep. And I had a related question because there was a political science study that showed in the areas where the U.S. military cracked down on the cross-border flow, essentially, that the black markets were really hurt in those areas. So, you know, sort of ironically, we hurt domestic markets uh, for people that lived in those areas where the U.S. was trying to crack down on, on some of the cross-border uh, movement and corruption. And so I just wonder, like, can there be unintended consequences of, that, that can hurt the population? Yeah, I, I actually think, and I don't, haven't seen that study, I didn't see any, any effort to crack down on any kind of cross-border anything. I mean, I just, it just, you know, and for me, the issue on cross-border was really, so I'd be, I'd need to know the details to be able to really answer that in, an, in, a, in a useful way. But what I saw going on was that the real cross-border traffic was basically undervaluing cross-border merchandise so that customs tariffs were low and, you know, for a bribe, right? So the problem with that was that the government was not earning the customs revenues that it deserved, which meant that the government was not going to be ever solvent. Um, and of course people like that because they don't have to pay high customs dues, right? But it is not a workable, you know, situation for the long term. Um, I think corruption had just about everything to do with the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan because of just what I said that, you know, I basically answered that during the course of the talk is that, um, how did we, you know, and I would have villagers come to me and say, the Taliban hits me on this cheek and the government hits me on that cheek. Why would that person stick their neck out to defend that government? Why would they take a mortal risk to, 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 to defend that government? And that really was the problem, was they were, every single time they interacted with the government, they were getting shaken down and being insulted while they were at it. So no one was really going to work on that. Now, the Taliban have proven to be no less corrupt than the government, if not more corrupt. But that's a kind of interesting development, too, because what I heard at the time during the 10 years I was there, which was 2002 through 2011, basically, um, was the previous Taliban regime had been oppressive but not corrupt. And that was unanimous. And I would have people pointing out like corrupt officials who had been publicly humiliated by the Taliban. Like they, it was almost like tarring and feathering they would do to really make it a shameful thing to do. And the thing is that in the intervening period, the Taliban had been sitting in Pakistan watching the billions flow in. And so this round of Taliban are a very different gang. I mean, they're the, often the same people, but they have been, their appetites got whetted 
um, by what they saw happening over the last 20 years. So I think, and this was what I was trying to persuade US officials, was I, I didn't get into corruption work in Afghanistan for ethical reasons. We were gonna lose. And I knew by 2011, when the US government officially decided it was not gonna address the problem in a, an official interagency process, um, I told my boss, the chairman, I'm not, we're gonna lose. I'm not working on Afghanistan anymore. And um, it's one that I don't like to say I told you so. Okay, you saw the writing on the wall. <laughs> Like, like with on corruption, it didn't make it any harder to take when it happened. That was pretty devastating last summer. Yes. Well, in my uh, international conflict class last spring, we we predicted the outbreak of the war before it happened. <laughs> so with Russia Ukraine, so I know right. Uh, right. a good exercise for us to try to to, yeah. to, to see those things coming. Yeah. Um, so someone has a question that we've spent. $15 billion was spent so far in Ukraine. Are they legit or is the culture too corrupt? Okay, so I um, take issue a bit with the notion of a corrupt culture. Uh, I have to say I've never been to a country working on these issues and had someone come up to me and say, Sarah, get off your corruption you know, bandwagon, whatever it is, soapbox here. We're, this is part of our culture. We don't mind it when our government officials steal from us. Like, I just have not ever found anyone say that. And the only person I've ever heard, or the only people I ever hear say that's part of their culture are Westerners who are not from that, from that place. Nevertheless, I think there is merit, a lot of merit in that question. It's not so much is the culture too corrupt, but is the structure, are the incentive structures all, you know, have they been so um, kind of well constructed and deeply rooted that um, they're gonna kick into gear sorry, I'm mixing my metaphors a little bit, with this influx of money. And I think there's a danger of that. I think there really is a danger of that. The one thing I have to say is Ukrainians have been, so regular Ukrainians have been through this a couple of times. They've had two anti-corruption revolutions and they have really been working at it. And so if there's a country that I would you know, I don't want to say trust, but I would feel comfortable cheering on to get the sort of post-kleptocracy um, dispensation right, or at least be working on it, it would be the Ukrainians. And I think it's fair to say that after the fall of, um, uh, uh, you know, God, sorry, it's been a little bit of a long day. Who was the... Russian-backed guy, Viktor Yanukovych. Yanukovych. After the fall of Yanukovych, I mean, they got to work. There was a lot of civil society effort and things like that. There are some really sophisticated anti-corruption organizations and investigative journalists in Ukraine. The concern I have is not just what's there, but also the crisis is a really interesting context because it both brings out our egalitarian tendencies as human beings. Um, one of the terrifying things I argue in on corruption is that it took two world wars, meaning two genocides, use of the nuclear bomb, a pandemic, you know, of the dimensions of COVID and an uh, economic meltdown, you know, the likes of which we haven't seen since, to knock us out of, knock the industrialized world out of the last bout of systemic corruption because widespread shared calamity does bring out 
uh, egalitarian tendencies and solidarity impulses in human beings. That's when we tend to help each other out without much regard for race or you know, all these various identity divides. So that's the upside in a way of the crisis situation in Ukraine. The downside is that crisis is also often exploited by the vultures. So you can look at the field day that was had in the wake of 2008, particularly in the real estate you know, area. Um, and we, we've also been talking about the COVID crisis relief funds were you know, both for BlackRock and the big corporations as well as these little scammers. So there's a lot pouring into Ukraine. The, the other, I think, positive side is it's mostly, as far as I know, in kind. I don't know how much, and maybe somebody else knows better than I do, how much cash is going in there. Do you know? I don't know. Yeah, so that's something, whoever asked that question, which is a great question, I would uh, invite you to go back and do some more research and take a look at that monetary figure how much of it is in money and how much of it is in night vision goggles and um, mortars and stuff like that. Okay. Thanks. As you see, I'm not a short answer kind of gal. So. Okay, maybe you can make this one shorter. Then. <laughs> I wouldn't hold your breath. Are you aware of any cases of successful anti-corruption reforms or campaigns? That's a very good question. And I would say a pro not much, not much. But a promising um, approach was something called the CSIG in Guatemala, which was a hybrid commission, initially aiming at um, kind of uh, human rights abuses from the civil war there, but it eventually turned toward um, corruption. And it, by hybrid, I mean it was a combination of local and international officials, but it was entirely independent. So it was a commission that could choose its own cases. Um, it wasn't the government that was telling it which cases to choose, and it could um, hire its own personnel. What's interesting is that, um, so there was one of these anti-corruption uprisings and toppled the government and then, you know, members of government were put in jail because of CSIG and then they had like a whole lot of other very, very um, probing things underway and the network reconfigured around a different um, leader who got rid of CSIG and that you know, so it was shut down, but so in a, ultimately it hasn't been successful in Guatemala, but I still find that it's a model that's pretty interesting. But I have to say no. And part of the reason I think has to do with this, we also have the tendency to think that corruption is a constant. And it is like violence is a constant. Like there's always violence in human society of some kind or another. But war is systematic, organized and socially sanctioned violence, right? Systemic corruption like I'm talking about is kind of like the corruption version of war. It's, it's organized, systemic, and to some extent socially sanctioned. And um, that was a feature of the industrialized world from the period of about 1870 until approximately 1935. And then we, you know, the industrialized world exported it, you know, to the post-colonial world largely. Um, but it was not as much of a feature of Western democracies as it started becoming, and again, I'll put a time range on it, 1980-ish is when this stuff starts getting, you know, worshipped again, and you start seeing systemic corruption kind of coming in in the 90, late 90s like that. Um, and you start seeing the uprisings against it in the 2000s. Um, we just don't have that much experience. There really hasn't been, but I, I guess I would say just from having said that, I would say one interesting example might be the New Deal. 
the New Deal in a way, and there were European counterparts to the New Deal, I think was, and it included, so it wasn't just the social welfare programs, it was things like antitrust enforcement. It was the tax, you know, um, structure. So there were a lot of dimensions of the New Deal that addressed some of these issues. Okay. Do you understand corruption as mainly a legal problem? That is, can it be controlled with the proper mix of deterrence and punishment? Or is corruption also a moral problem and contro controlling it requires changes in people's moral outlooks? Um, so I would say that that is a both. Legal, the problem with understanding it legally is that really sophisticated corrupt networks change the laws. So if you only think of corruption as quid pro quo bribery, well, then your legal system has failed you in addressing corruption. But if you think of corruption as being the result of certain incentive structures, you can certainly use the legal system to adjust those incentive structures. You use the legal system to punish. So let's talk about criminal justice reform, right? Where's the, the um, my pals in sociology, sociology and criminology? Who, are, are any of you here? Yeah, cool. So I found one of the interesting issues about the recent push on criminal justice reform there were a lot of people noticing that the Koch brothers were aligned with this effort and, you know, Kushner was too. Well, since when do the Koch brothers really care about street, street level, you know, drug criminals who are being kept in jail too long? Like what, since when are they? So what I started to realize is um, there are non-dangerous nonviolent crimes and there are incredibly dangerous nonviolent crimes like bank fraud, like what gave us 2008. But if you lump those together as all of those are nonviolent crime, you know, they, and they, those people shouldn't go to jail, nonviolent criminals shouldn't go to jail, you're letting people like the Kochs who are responsible for hundreds of violations of state and federal law and regulation um, off scot-free. So the legal system can, if correctly deployed, um, that's what a legal system is for, right? It's for not only for punishing people who have done bad stuff and ideally deterring other people from doing bad stuff. It's also the best way we have as a collectivity of making clear what we consider to be okay and what we consider to be not okay. And no rule book, no, you know, list of commandments passes that message better than the enforcement of laws. That being said, so long as we think it doesn't matter where your money came from, you're not going to get that legal system. So there is a cultural dimension to this that every single one of us can participate in by not adulating, not revering people just because they're super rich. And I'm not trying to say that we all need to become paupers or, or and I'm not trying to glorify poverty by any, by any means. I'm not denying that we all want a certain level of material and moral dignity in our lives that money, unfortunately, is needed to provide. But there is a kind of fascination with the super rich in our culture that I don't think was part of our culture in the 1960s and 70s. I think that, you know, you, you know the people who were in colleges in the, in the 1960s, they wouldn't be seen dead on Wall Street. My graduating class, that's where everybody went. I was graduating class of 1984, and bam, it was a beeline for Wall Street. So I think there is an ethical and moral dimension, but again, I don't think ordinary people think it's okay to steal, for the government to steal. So, I, so, so again, I, the, the moral aspect, I kind of think the moral, the moral aspect is really in those 
upper echelons, what is being rewarded? You know, when you as a 24-year-old go to join Goldman Sachs, what is the incentive structure that is causing you to ignore the harm that you are causing by short selling, you know what I mean, like stock that, that, that your company has been selling to people as a great buy. Like what, what is the internal incentive structure that is frankly um, overriding your natural moral understanding of what's right and wrong. So it's more like a revival of our moral standing and of our moral instincts in a way. And then it's about actually calling people on it, you know? It's about if it's your workplace, if it's your, you know, we also are kind of instinctively polite and we sort of don't want to call stuff out. And we're increasingly beginning, I think, to call things out, but it tends to be on identity issues. So it's me too, and it's racial issues, and it's, you know, it's political issues. We point partisan fingers. But I'm not seeing, again, much holding of our own communities up to their standards. In the U.S. context, do you think, first of all, has the amount of corruption changed from, say, Obama to Trump to Biden administration? Um, and also, what, what can we do in the U.S. context specifically to address that corruption? Um, so I gave a few pointers on what we can do in the U.S. context, but in on corruption, not that I'm flogging my wares out there or anything, but there is a whole chapter that focuses on it. But it, it, I mean, part of the way the networks work is through a kind of monopoly control of the private sector and then the public sector levers of power that, that have an impact on that private sector. So it is about don't, don't buy on Amazon, you know? Um, buy from the local bookstore, and if you have to go further, you know, so, so I think there is, a, there, there is some voting. We, if money equals speech for the moment, well, let's vote with our, with our wallets, and let's choose to patronize, um, uh, you know, the private sector that exists on a level that we can exert some community control over it. You know, my local bookstore, I can actually say if there's something that they're doing. If, if I find out that they're mistreating their employees, you're in a community there, I can actually, you know, maybe talk to the owner about it. Um, it's on a level, whereas when you're into the Amazons or the Home Depots or whatever, you, you, can't, you can't have any leverage over that. Um, I would say also in the U.S., again, the killer on, let me put it this way, kleptocratic networks have the power and the money. We have the numbers. So what's the best way we, we're going to lose is if we lose numbers by fighting amongst ourselves. So are there some principles that we can actually join hands across the identity divides, including across the political divide? and say, you hold your side up to this, and I'll hold my side up to this, instead of the opposite. Or let's say, are there one or two principles that we could start making a candidate's pledge across the political divide, and hold hands with our other party friends, and get our candidates, maybe on the local level for starters, but get them to sign up to these principles, and then hold them to it afterwards. I mean, I think that the only way we're going to really be able to address this is make it a bipartisan issue. And again, I find us much faster to hold people in power over ident uh, to account over identity issues than over public integrity and corruption issues. Um, I would like to say that Yes, of course, I see some differences in quantity between corruption in 
the three administrations that were mentioned. But I don't think it is useful for me to go into that. Because once again, what's more important is hold your own side up to its highest standards. And so it's too easy to say, yeah, but they're worse. And once I start doing that, I'm just feeding into the, okay, I get it, my side's a little bit bad, but that side is so much worse, so I will give my side a pass, because if I don't, it might lose the election, and these much worse guys are gonna win, and so, you know, and that is a downward spiral. And so, in a way, I almost go out of my way and it was hard to take as I started learning some of this stuff about kind of the side that I'm more affiliated with. I don't really feel like I'm a cheerleader of either of the political party, but I definitely have a color that I'm more associated with. And boy, oh boy, you know, you see a lot of the very, very same behaviors. And um, the danger also of that so let's take one that a lot of people seem to agree about, the deregulation of the 1980s. Minute. Sorry? One minute warning. Oh, yeah. Oh, one, um, more one more question. Okay, the deregulation of the 1980s is frequently called the Reagan Revolution, right? Got it, but who expanded on that deregulation? Bill Clinton. And let's take a look at what that means. It's, I'm not, I, what I want to say is the point isn't so much to tot up who did worse deregulatory damage, Reagan or Clinton, but what you have when you have a Reagan revolution that is then reinforced by Bill Clinton is that it becomes a bipartisan orthodoxy. If it had just been Reagan, then you could say that is an extremist position of one strand in the Republican Party. But once the Democratic Party comes in behind and expands it, then it's like, oh, well, this is what all the political parties are doing. And then you have half of the American public who doesn't bother to vote. And so there is both sides of that equation are very damaging in different ways. One pushes the envelope and the other makes it orthodoxy. Um, so what's the last okay, question? Okay, the last question is, what do you see as the next breaking story of corruption? <laughs> Give you a chance to forecast the future. That's a really interesting question, but what I am, and I don't know if I went down this rabbit hole in this context yet, but the, the, did I do the whole Federal Reserve rant? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that's one that um, really troubles me, obviously, because the Federal Reserve is applauded as being quote unquote independent. It may be independent of the two political parties, it is not independent of Wall Street. And that's what it needs to be independent of. And I see the Federal Reserve basically bowed down to across the political spectrum. I mean, it is amazing how difficult it is to address. This is an organization that I think we now have nine members of the Board of Governors. At the time that those $6 trillion were being doled out, there were seven individuals. So I would look for corruption issues, look for choke points like that. Another choke point is, you know, uh, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court. And, but as I say again, we have this tendency to see it in partisan terms, but on corruption, it's been unanimous time and time again. My editor on On Corruption in America um, edited an RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg biography, this fat, right? I mean, the thing was three inches fat, and she sends it to me, and it's like, I'm, not, you know. What is not in that biography is the fact that Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote 
the, the unanimous opinion on one of the cases in this series. And my editor, when that, so of course I put that in, you know, when my editor saw that, she was like, her eyebrows went through her hair. Um, so I think it's, it's the choke points like that um, that I would keep my eye on, and I would keep my eye on crises. Again, crisis, sadly, can be very salutary because it really took all of those calamities um, to generate the New Deal and its equivalents in Europe. But crisis is also an unbelievably fruitful place for corruption to happen. So, so again, COVID is a great one. And, and it puts us in this place, again, not to go down another rabbit hole, but vaccines and big pharma and stuff like that. I mean, so it's now become so ideological about your position on vaccines that if you are not, literally in my neighborhood in Washington, there is a street, someone papered over their street sign with, in Fauci we trust. And I'm like, now wait one second. That way is, is, it, you know, you, you don't blindly trust anybody in a position of power. And we're in a situation right now where you cannot even ask legitimate questions of the pharmaceutical monopoly in this country because of the ideological, you know, fight we're having over vaccines. And I think, you know, not to engage this topic, but why is it that the only vaccines that were, that got government money on COVID were mRNA? Why was there no standard vaccine that, you know, and there is one that has been developed, but they could not get any government money for it. So there is something weird going on there um, that I'm not comfortable with at all. And, Yes, I got vaccinated twice um, and everything like that. So, but it's, it's very awkward to raise these questions about the pharmaceutical in industry right now. Or for example, sorry, I know like one more question and all that stuff, but um, so we, there's a lot of vitriol that one hears about people who are vaccine skeptics, right? This is over time. So that's one, um, wave. Then we get the wave of, oh yes, um, black Americans have the right to be skeptical because of Tuskegee, because of, you know, the experimentation that was done on blacks at Tuskegee. So that becomes the cutout. I never heard any cutout that reminded people that the very same white-coated doctors that we are supposed to roll up our sleeves in front of today are the same ones who told us that OxyContin was not addictive. I have not heard that connection made. We are how many hundred thousand opioid overdose deaths into that pandemic? And I have not heard any connection made between the reasonable skepticism that somebody can have about a doctor after having been through that and now being told that a radically new um, vaccine to, I, I'm not trying to persuade anybody not to get vaccinated. I'm just, again, asking for a little bit of um, even handedness in the way that we address these types of issues. So that's, again, not quite an, a, a way of uh, explaining what corruption crisis, I think, is going to be. But, but I'm saying, look at crisis. Crisis spawns corruption. Thank you very much for your tolerance for my long answer. <laughs>